Hello! Up to this point, we have been working uh, almost exclusively in terms of flux. Uh, that is, how much thermal energy is moving uh, through some sort of cross-sectional area. Um, and that's great if you're interested in the big picture. Um, but if you're interested in a more complex geometry and understanding what's happening to a temperature field over time, uh, we need some different equations. Uh, and that's where the heat equation comes in. This is going to be an equation that tells us for a given position in space, uh, what happens to the temperature conditions at that position uh, based upon the conditions around it uh, and the conditions of that temperature field. And so we're going to start off today by figuring out what the heat equation is. So, Fourier's law is that rate equation. That tells us the flux when we know the temperature field. If we want to know the temperature field, we need more. Okay, and that's our, that's our heat equation. And the origin of the heat equation is the first law. So we've dealt with the first law a little bit, uh, but we can determine the heat equation basically by taking uh, the first law um, and applying it to a differential um, equation to a to a uh, volume that has been shrunk down to an infinitesimal size uh, and then we'll throw in Fourier's law to uh, to help us out and, and get us the variables that we want so let's get deriving I know that's not, nothing gets the students worked up quite like a good derivation so here we go so, as with a lot of derivations, uh, we're going to start with an uh, infinitesimal cube, a little volume, and we're going to look and see what's happening to the temperature in that space, depending on what's happening at its boundaries. Okay. To make it easier, uh, so that we come up with a, the, the simplest equation we can, we're going to make some assumptions. One, one d. So we're just going to talk about thermal energy moving in this direction. There's not going to be any energy moving in that direction or into or out of the screen. No bulk motion. So this is going to be uh, either a solid or a static fluid. Uh, so we don't need to deal with fluid flow. Uh, and we're only going to talk about changes in sensible energy. So we're not going to have any phase change here. Um, the solid is going to remain a solid the whole time. Um, again, to sort of simplify, what that means is that our energy is going to be proportional to our change in temperature. Uh, and that's really the variable we're most interested in here is our temperature variable. So with those assumptions, we can go to our first law and I can write the first law like this. Uh, the change in sensible temperature is equal to whatever energy is going in plus whatever is going out plus whatever is being generated. Okay. And if we recognize this guy as being proportional to the change in temperature uh, and also calculate the, the mass of this cube by multiplying the density of the material times its three dimensions, uh, then we can write that equation like this. Okay, and this looks kind of nasty, but it's not. It's not too bad. This is a change in temperature. Um, we multiply that by the specific heat of the material and its mass, that gives us the overall change in energy. Uh, and that's going to be equal to the flux through the left-hand side of our cube, which is going to be delta Y times delta Z. Those are just dimensions of our cube, uh, minus the flux over here at the right side, right? That's our flux out. So we've, we're basically calling moving left to right as a positive direction here. And then here we have a, a generation term that is now going to be joules uh, per second per unit volume. Okay, uh, so we're multiplying multiplying that or uh, by the volume to get the total generation. So we end up with this guy, uh, and we want to try to simplify that. So what do we want to do? Well. Uh, that Q out term right here is going to be problematic because we don't know exactly what to do with this plus delta X here. Uh, and so 
to figure out what the difference between QX and QX plus delta X is, we're going to use what's called a Taylor series. So you probably ran into that uh, in one of your calculus classes. And a Taylor series looks like this. And what this tells us is that um, my variable at this point, a little bit farther along than QX, is going to be QX plus whatever, however fast QX is changing times the distance away that QX plus is, plus basically how much that rate of change is changing, so the curvature of that change. Now this, we can keep going, Taylor series are infinite, uh, but we're not going to. Uh, we're going to actually ignore all of these higher terms, including this one. And the reason why we can ignore that is this right here, okay? So if delta x is infinitesimal, if it's very small, delta x squared is really, really small. So what we're saying is essentially that the, um, the function of flux across here is gonna be almost linear, okay? That's this term, okay? So there's a change in flux, but it changes simply by a slope multiplied by how far away that is. The reason that's good enough for us is that that's going to be true as long as delta x is very small, okay? Even, even a, a really curvy, curvy uh, function, if you shrink it down small enough, uh, that's going to look like a linear function, okay? So that's why we get rid of that second term. Now that introduces some error, right? So we have to sort of recognize um, that as we go along too. So here we have um, this uh, equation up here with now the Taylor series inserted in here, right? Our first two terms of the Taylor series. So we've gotten rid of Q at X plus Delta X and replaced it with a couple of uh, Q at X terms. So that's going to make things a little bit simpler. It, again, it looks kind of nasty, but what is this? It's just the first law. It's just telling us the change in energy of this cube is whatever goes in minus whatever goes out. So when we expand that Q out term, in other words, just multiply it out, what we had before, uh, we find this equation. In other words, here's our multiplied part out this term plus this here. These two are identical, right? Plus this minus that. Great, we get to knock those out uh, and we simplify our terms even further. Beyond crossing these out, we might notice, okay, every term now has a delta x, delta y, delta z. Delta x, delta y, delta z, delta x, delta y, delta z. That's our volume. We're going to divide out by our volume here. Okay? And when we do that, we end up with this equation down here. Okay? What does this equation mean? Well, our guy up here tells us that it's the slanty P times C, um, which is not that helpful. <laughs> sorry, sorry, funny guy. Uh, what does it mean? This guy is the change in energy of our infinitesimal Q is equal to the change in the flux from one side of the cube to the other side of the cube plus whatever energy is being generated here. Okay, This term is the one that it matters to us most. It's basically saying if if Q gets bigger, in other words, if this term without the negative sign is positive, if Q gets bigger as I move from X to X plus delta X, that means more energy is leaving than is coming into the system. And that's gonna mean, if this is positive, if that slope is positive, then this term is negative, And that's gonna mean my energy in my volume is going down and my temperature is gonna go down. So that's all this says is same thing that that first law says, just in a differential form. Now, I said before that the, the 
variable we want is temperature. So we've got to get rid of these QX terms because that's going to be hard to, if we had to deal with QX going in three directions uh, in a, like a simulation, that would be a lot of trouble. Uh, we want to just have one, one field, the temperature field, that's going to tell us what's going to happen to, the, uh, to that temperature field. So we can replace that QX with Fourier's law, okay, right? Because Fourier's law tells us that Q uh, double prime is equal to negative K dTx. So that's what this guy is. We're just using Fourier's law and replacing Q with this, okay? Now that looks, you know, again, <laughs> everything, <laughs> all, all, all partial differential equations look scary. Um, but we can simplify this some more. We're going to assume that K is constant. Um, not necessarily true if you have really big temperature differences. K can differ significantly. Uh, but most of the time, we're going to be able to say that K is a material constant. So we pull that out of the differential uh, term here. Uh, and so we have a uh, rate of a rate, in other words, a second uh, order uh, differential equation. That is the heat equation. There it is. <laughs> See, you knew you could. Uh, we could do it. We could. Uh, we can derive an, an, a nice heat equation. Uh, and all that is again, it's just the first law. It's just telling us whatever's going into that cube is coming back out of that cube. Okay. And that we'll talk more about the, what this guy means, but it's basically saying how much is the flux changing from one side of the cube to the other side of the cube. Remember, dt dx tells us what the flux is. So this is saying, how much is the flux changing? Okay. Now, we could do the same thing in 3D, and it really wouldn't be all that much more complicated. It would just be a lot more variables. Uh, and we could get this result right here. Uh, and so we get that second order derivative in each term, right? Because we want to know how much is the flux changing in each of those terms. Is more Q coming in here than over here? Is more Q coming in here than down here? Uh, and so forth. The Q dot term is a volumetric term. It only has to do with the volume. So we don't have to use uh, any multiple dimensions for that one. Now, dividing that through by density and specific heat, remember, we want to have a temperature equation. So we want to move this all uh, to the other side of the equation. Introduces an idea of thermal diffusivity. Uh, and we mentioned this in an early lecture, but here's where it sort of shows up uh, as at alpha here. Um, and that alpha is equal to K over rho over C. So this tells us how fast thermal energy can move through a material, right? This one tells us how well a material absorbs that thermal energy, right? If we, if we have a big density or a big specific heat, it takes a lot of thermal energy to change our temperature. So this, if it's big, is going to suggest temperature is going to change more slowly. This is going to suggest that temperature is going to change more quickly uh, if we have a significant um, difference in flux on the two sides of our cube. So this guy right here, this is kind of our final form of the heat equation. This is what we'll use uh, for the rest of the term when we want to pull out the heat equation. Uh, it is a second order partial differential equation, uh, partial because it's in x, y, and t, second order because we've got these second order terms. Uh, and the solution takes the form of a time-dependent temperature field. Uh, in other words, T at all of the possible positions at all of the position possible times, okay, from an initial condition to a final condition. All right, let's talk a little bit before we close here about what this means, uh, our, our beautiful little equation. The second derivative calculates the potential net flux into the volume um, because it expresses a change in slope of the temperature field. In other words, second derivatives express curvature, right? How much is this 
if this is our temperature from here to here, how much is this slope changing here? Why does the curvature of that line matter? Because the slope on each side tells us uh, how much um, flux is going out that side, right? So here we have a high dt dx. That would mean I'd be getting a lot of flux through here uh, and a low slope over here, so less flux headed out in that direction on the right side. So I've got a lot of flux coming in here, not much coming out there. My curvature is positive, right? So this would be a positive term, and that would tend to make my temperature go up if all of my other uh, terms are equal. So that second derivative tells us the curvature of the temperature field, uh, but more importantly, it tells us the change in slope, right? The change in flux from one side of the field or, or of the volume to another. And thermal diffusivity, as we talked about before, tells us, okay, if I have a big change in slope here, how much is that gonna change the, the actual temperature? If I've got a big K and I've got a difference in slope, there's gonna be a lot of movement of thermal energy, right? If I've got a small rho C, it's not going to absorb that energy very well uh, and the temperature is going to go up. So this is a material component that tells us, given the shape of the temperature field, uh, how much is it going to actually move thermal energy and raise the temperature of a given um, point. Okay, so we can write out, you know, in a, a, a nice, easily defined way what that alpha means. K is the ability to move thermal energy Rho C is the ability to store thermal energy. This is big, temperature changes quickly. If this is big, temperature is going to change more slowly. And there it is, that's the heat equation.